This is a hypothetical. You're uh, sitting in court and you receive a motion to quash a felony warrant on be filed on behalf of a veteran in another jurisdiction who is receiving treatment at the hands of the Veterans Administration. The uh, Veterans Administration finds out that this veteran has this outstanding warrant and alerts the veteran that if that warrant is not quashed, he will no longer be eligible for veterans treatment benefits. So on behalf of that veteran, a motion to quash is filed in your department. And at the hearing of that motion, the DA is yelling that they want that veteran to be brought back to this jurisdiction to face the penalties for violating probation or whatever it was that gave rise to the felony warrant. So if I've set it up right, you have a veteran in another jurisdiction who's at risk of losing their treatment benefits. Um, because of this warrant, what are you going to do? Mike Davidson. I, again, am probably the only one sitting at this table who has actually confronted those kinds of issues uh, in real life. Uh, we make those decisions every day in my court. Um, I, I will tell you that they are difficult decisions to make. Any judge, uh, as well as any prosecutor who's worth his salt, looks at all of the facts and circumstances surrounding a situation before making the decision. I will tell you that in our court now, and it's nice for people to talk about what they're going to do when they become judges, uh, what you do and what you have done is a little bit more of an indicator of how you actually feel about things and what you're going to do in the future. We have veterans in our court all the time now. We respect and we honor our veterans. And where I can, I cut them slack. Because I have always believed, and you'll hear other judges in this jurisdiction use this analogy that I coined many years ago, apropos because this is Las Vegas. Uh, if you're a good guy during your lifetime, you accumulate a certain amount of chips in front of you. If you make a mistake or you do something stupid, you get to spend some of those chips. If you've led an exemplary life, you have a lot of chips. I think that active duty folks and veterans have earned a lot of chips. And so, to answer your hypothetical question, I start with the assumption that you're a good guy if you've served your country. That doesn't mean that you are automatically going to get a pass for bad conduct. That's not true. Everybody's accountable. But when I make the decisions today that I make as a chief prosecutor and I will make as a judge in the kind of situations you've laid out, I have to look at the whole panoply of facts and circumstances. If I've got a guy who is not a threat to the community, if I've got a guy who has made some mistakes but is on the right track, and I don't care whether it's medical treatment, psychological treatment, whatever services that are being provided, I want to see that veteran or any other defendant for that purpose who's led a good life have the advantage and have the benefit of pursuing treatment. I can't give you a definitive answer to your particular question without knowing some more details. I need to know whether he's being held on a warrant because he committed murder or because of something else. Uh, those are different cases. But what I will tell you is that the fact that a, a man or a woman has honorably served his or her country is an important factor in the decisions that I make every day as a chief prosecutor and will continue to make as a judge. Jerry Weiss, um, I think I have to respond similarly as far as uh, the, the severity of the crime, whatever this person's uh, being charged with, there's a bench warrant because they apparently didn't do something that uh, they were supposed to have been doing uh, for, a, for a felony charge. You said it was a felony, not a misdemeanor. So um, if it's a murder case, I think it's different than a uh, felony drug case. Um, I do want to see veterans get the treatment that they need. So if it's a, if it's a nonviolent case and it's a minor infraction, I'm, I'm going to quash the warrant and let the person continue to get treatment, uh, set another court hearing or whatever we need to do in the future to, to bring it back in the future. Um, if it is a, um, at the same time, I think we need to consider the AB 187 that, that's been passed. And if it's a nonviolent crime and we bring them back here, we can, we can get them into a treatment program here, put them on probation, so it shouldn't be a problem. We should be able to get them the treatment, the medication that they need through the VA here. Um, that being said, I don't think you want to mess with the status quo if the person is getting treatment, getting the care that they need in another jurisdiction, 
if it's a nonviolent crime, I'm going to let that I'm going to let that go. If it is a murder case or something like that that we need to have them stand trial for or something here, I think we bring them back and we do the best we can to use the 187 to uh, to get them the treatment that they need here. Thank you. Thank you, Trish Palm. Um, I, I think that the, the answer to this question can only be that as a judge you have to look at all the facts and circumstances that are before you. And I believe the hypothetical involved a uh, uh, prosecutor jumping up and down. And, <laughs> and you, you can't be too swayed by that. Uh, the state has a stake in something and there's prosecutors with individual you know, personalities who might differ from the office you know, and what the office goals are. So as a judge you have to be able to look at everything and see what is required under the law and what is the best um, outcome for everybody. I don't, I don't think we thank our men and women for service as we should if we're going to ignore the fact that you know, this person has served our country and might have a mental illness and is getting treatment and that might be the best thing to continue. And you have to look at the, serious of the seriousness of the crime and you know, is, it, is it something that needs to be interfered with or not. So I, I don't think you can answer that without you know, actually having the case in front of you and knowing you know, all the circumstances. But I definitely think that we need to always keep in mind that you know, we need to thank people for their service and, and recognize that people suffer because of their service. Thank you. Craig Friedberg, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, to help me define your question a little bit more. The, you said that he was no longer eligible for VA benefits. Was it, are those VA benefits he was receiving in Nevada or in whatever hypothetical state? Well, I understand that, but I mean, where, where they're actually getting them. The setup is that he's receiving VA benefits in another jurisdiction. Okay, all right. Um, and yes, VA benefits, of course, are federal, and uh, he, he can get them anywhere. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure I understood that. I think that the public policies established by the uh, state legislature is that veterans have often have special needs. Uh, coming back, they have needs that come from uh, PTSD, that may come from uh, use of uh, substances, uh, or other things that have occurred to them because of what they went through for this country. And uh, the chips definitely are very high in gathering for a veteran. If, as most of the uh, people on this panel have said, it really does depend on what the felony is for. If we're talking about essentially a nonviolent felony, then because of the public policy that has been established in this state, then I would, of course, listen to all sides and find out more about the case. But all things being equal, I think that this state can provide this veteran uh, with the help that he needs. And should he complete that treatment program, which under the bill has to be done in order to avoid any type of uh, regular sentencing, then we can bring him back and deal with that extradition motion at that time. 